Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. This is the third class in our series of five classes, What is Sufism? And before we begin what we'll talk about tonight, which will be the awliya and the Sheikh Murid relationship, I want to go back to some of the things we've talked about before. And uh, here I'll begin with a question which has come to us in many different ways. <coughs> um, well, well, let me see, I won't begin with that, I'll come to it after that. But um, in the very first lesson, when we define Sufism, we said that it is the path of Ihsan, and therefore it is the path to God. And nothing less than that works. It must be the path to God. So that's your intention in seeking to follow uh, the dictates of Ihsan. And when we said also that when you make that intention to get close to God and to be for God and to worship God is as if you could see Him, then Satan will come at you from every direction and in every way. You will be his object of war. And this is why the Sufi path, as we said, is a path of mujahada. It's got to be. It's struggle. And it's jihad. It has to be. Uh, and you have to do that jihad against Satan, and you have to do it against that Satan, that Yazid, which is in ourself which is the nafs, which we say in our tradition is greater than 70 satans. And we mentioned then that this is so difficult that many people retreat. And the word that we used was they make a truce. Uh, they put up the white flag and they give in. Um, that is that this is too much for me. I just want to go back to life as usual. And let me be a believer, let me pray and fast, but let me not challenge your domain to Satan. So we call that making a truce with Satan. And when we talked about that in the first class, and I believe that we may have come back to it in the second, we talked about it in such a way as if this were a fundamental difference between those people who love the path and who would love to be on it, such as myself and probably yourself, and between the rank and file of the believers, the believers in common. And we said that most of them put up the white flag. And therefore, they don't actually involve themselves in this struggle. And that's to their danger, it's to their detriment. But one of the things that we have to stress uh, tonight, uh, just to make sure that we get this right, is that when we speak of the metaphor of putting up the white flag and making, making the truth with truce, truce with Satan, the, the hudna, you know, uh, with Satan, then actually this should be applied to people of the path also. So this was something I didn't think of, and it needs to be added. Because when you're on the path, Satan will again continually come at you from every direction, and so will your nafs. And so therefore, just as there is a general truce that many Muslims make, so that they don't embark on the path of mujahada. So also, there's the potential danger that we make such a truce when on the path itself. Maybe we should add that we don't make it knowingly, but then who does? 
because none of our blessed brothers and sisters who are not on the path actually made a truce with Satan. This is a metaphor. And what it means is that you cease to go forward with the kind of diligence that you should have. And, you know, so we want to come back to that. Um, and again, we, may, we called it a truce with Satan, and really we should call it a truce with Satan or with the nefs, with the ego, because both of these are involved. Both of them are the enemy party. And Satan and the nefs will st try to stop you or to derail you or to delude you or to destroy you any way he can on the path. And often the path is likened in the metaphor of the old Islamic world of caravans and of traveling on camels and donkeys and mules and walking. Often it's compared to the travel, to the route of the caravan. And as you know, in Islamic civilization, usually we had caravan routes and they had caravanserais. In fact, our word hotel uh, comes into the Western languages from funduk, and the funduk was, which becomes in Spanish, honda, you know, it, um, it was originally a caravanserai hotel. And therefore, you can go look at them, and they're set up to receive the camels and everything. And they're usually very beautiful that the caravanserais had gardens, they had awqaf, they had water. Uh, and so therefore the Sufis like to say that Ibn Allah especially talks about this, that as you take that path, then, uh, you know, you will be called at every point to say that, why should I go further? This is so beautiful. I can just live in this caravanserai and stay here. I've got everything I need. <clears throat> so this is also making a truce with the self and with Satan. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep checking yourself. And therefore also part of that process of the truce and the white flag with Satan is that you will be given by Satan and by your ego a sense of contentment with where you are. I've done so much, and mashallah, you've got your awrad, and you've got your adhkar, and you're doing them every day, and uh, that's, you should really be proud. You've accomplished so much. So you're given a sense of completeness before you're complete, and you're given a sense of accomplishment before, before you've done the great accomplishment, and you're given a sense of perfection before you've actually reached that. And again, part of the psychology of the true people of the path, the real Sufis, as we've said and we repeat, is they always regard themselves at the beginning. And they never make the claim of perfection or of arrival. Okay, that's typical of them. They don't do that. And they're extremely humble in this regard. And, um, you know, so this is a very important to make point to make. Also part of this truce process can be exemplified in a false sense of pride or uh, accomplishment that is given to you that look at what you've done. You've been on the path so long. You're not like you used to be. You know, you've changed. It's true, you have. In fact, you've become more and more beautiful. But beware of looking in the mirror. Beware of looking in the mirror. And beware of being uh, contented, you know, with where you are. Um, even with the awrad and the adhkar that we do, uh, we must be very careful never to feel that just because we did the numbers, we did the intent of those numbers. So a lot of times people on the path, they become fascinated with, and they become preoccupied with the numbers of their adhkar. <coughs> and I did my 1,000, I did my 313, I did my 200. Yes, but, I mean, were you present in any of that? And maybe you got the secret of the number, which could even be arrogance and pride, 
but you didn't get the secret of God, which is what was there in every single dhikr that you made. So I just wanted to come back to that uh, because it's very important. Also, with regard to that, one of the ways that Satan usually gets people to make the truce and put up the red flag is that he frightens them. That what happens if you continue to go? And again, this can be before the path so that you don't take it. And it can also be on the path so that you slow down or you leave it. And so here, what is the cure? And it's very important here to emphasize that Satan will attempt to make you do this by fear and especially by the insinuation and you know the waswasa that you are weak and that you can't do this and look at all your failures and look at you know your incapacities and so forth so therefore part of the cure of that is to know that Satan is weak. Inna kaida shaytani kana da'ifa o kama qala azza wa jal. So you have to remember that the plot of Satan, the plan of Satan, it is weak. Satan himself is weak. And although I am weak, but I'm strong in God. And God is strong. And so therefore, you've got to also draw on your strength in drawing on your confidence in God and face Satan in this and not allow him ever to intimidate you. You cannot allow him to do that. And you have to remember that, inshallah, you are strong. Even though you're weak and your strength is in your weakness and in your turning to God. And you will become stronger and stronger and stronger because you will come closer and closer to God. In fact, you will become more and more real. God is the real. He is the Haq. And the closer that we come to Him, the more real we also become. And Satan is weak. And as we proceed in the path, especially as we are effectively able um, not to be deflected by Him, then we also become strong stronger and he becomes weaker and weaker and weaker but he'll always try and he will always have a masquerade he will always have a mask that he uses to come after us so I just wanted to go back to that point the truce and now let's just look you know briefly over what we talked about last time last time we emphasized the fact that um, the reality of this path is bringing together the outward and the inward. So we are not esoterics. We are not botanies. But we're also not exoterics. We're not vahiris. And the way of the prophets is one of joining together the outward with the inward so that you have something much greater than exotericism because we honor the zahir tremendously and it intoxicates us and we accept it as the zahir and you have something much greater than esotericism because esotericism as an absolute belief in the inwardness and not the outwardness of things it is actually very very illusory and very toxic and very dangerous. So here you've got to have the sandals of the Prophet you've got to walk in his sandals or walk in his footsteps and you've got to protect yourself from that infinite sea that has no shore and no bottom by being in the Ark of Noah which is the Sharia. We've got to have Tawabit, we've got to have these Tawabit. We then talked about perverting the reality under the cover of the name. And we began, of course, as you remember, by mentioning the aphorism of the early Sufis. It appears at least as early as the fourth century. 
when they said, the 10th century of the Common Era, when they said al Hujwari is one of the ones who says that, that Sufism was a reality without a name. Then it became a name without a reality. So it is the people who take that name and don't have that reality, they are a disaster. And as we'll see tonight, when we talk about the awliya, you have of course the awliya of Allah. They are the ones that we love and they are the ones we imitate and we would love to be with and be like and be accepted by and maybe become. But you also have the awliya of shaitan. And we emphasize the principle from the very beginning that <clears throat> the Sufis are always doing the opposite of Satan. You know, so also they will do the opposite of the awliya of shaitan. But the awliya of, of Satan they are very, very real. And the war is really between them and, I wish we could say, us, the awliya of Allah. That's where the battle takes place. So they will present themselves in all kinds of different ways. And the false sheikh, we need to talk about him a little bit. And you ask questions about that. But the false sheikh, at his worst, is definitely one of the awliya of shaitan. And he's one of the biggest ones of all. He's one of the waylayers of the believers on the highest path there is. Okay, so uh, we talked then about the fraudulent sheikh. And we mentioned there the dangers of the fraudulent sheikh. And we mentioned there also the dangers of the false teacher, false scholar, the abusive scholar. The one who doesn't practice what he preaches. He tells you all these great things, but he doesn't do it himself. He's maybe a munafiq, and if he is, may God cure him. But he's a big problem, and the trauma that comes from him is second to the trauma that comes from the false sheikh. And then you have um, the false or hypocritical Quran reciter. So we talked about that. But what are the signs of the false sheikh? So yesterday we talked about that in the questions and answers, and I don't want to repeat that. But um, one of the questions that came up is, are there different types of them, false sheikhs? So this has to be answered. And in fact, this would apply to everything else. It would apply to the scholar, and it would apply also to the Qur'an reciter. And this is very important because we do have to acknowledge that they, are, they also have different degrees. Some of them are horrific. Some of them are absolutely horrific. And they are awliya shaitan. And some of them are not so bad, but they're not the real thing. So they have different degrees, just like if we look at scholars, uh, some of them can be really hypocritical and really contradict in their behavior everything they talk about. But then there's some that are not that bad, but they're not that good either. So you have different degrees. And with Quran, Quran reciters, it would be like that as well. Um, you know, so this is also very important. that they have different degrees and they're not all the same um, now nevertheless the path is to come to God and in coming to God the path is to become real and it means also to become 100 percent you because you came into this world world, not a pauper. You came into this world a rich person with an inheritance that only God knows the reality of. You are the daughter of Adam. You are the son of Adam. So uh, you want to be a hundred percent. And one of the greatest purposes of the shaykh is to make you 100%. So 
This cannot happen if he is not 100%. So we want the Sheikh who is 100%. And again, we want to beware of the false Sheikh, especially the ones that belong to the awliya of Shaitan. But then, even if we look at others who we don't really know quite where to place them, but red flags are there, and there are other problems there, then there you want to look for the one who's 100%. And if the sheikh is 30%, you're not going to be more than 30%. So he may not be false. And, you know, among the sheikhs who are not the real thing are the ones who taught themselves, the ones who also break their trust. And we hope to talk about this at some time, that we have this thing called silsila, the chain of transmission, which is extremely important. And alhamdulillah, we as Qadris have an amazing silsila going back to al-Hasan al-Basri. And we have another one going back to Imam al-Hasan himself, to an Imam Ali. Um, but that silsila is of no value if I cut it. Okay? And if I cut it, I hope I wouldn't be a false pretender. But nevertheless, I'm not 100% at all. And probably I will crash. And you see this happen to many sheikhs. They crash. <coughs> they crash. Now, sometimes they never really had a silsila. But sometimes they cut their silsila they had. And how do we do that? Well, we do that, first of all, by not honoring its principles, by betraying it. Because the silsila is <coughs> khidmah and muhabba and adab. That's what it's all about. So what if I use the sila, silsila to be makhdum? You know? And to be beloved, but not really to love. So I cut the silsila. I have betrayed it. So the silsila doesn't empower you if you don't take its power. And this would be another place where Satan is there to get you to make a very ugly truce. Right? Like, why don't we just make you such and such? And you're actually not. So you have to be true to the silsila. And then there's another way that we can cut the silsila as well. Well, I mean, I and most of you, or many of you, are followers of Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. I love him with a love which is insane. Truly, I love him, I love him, I love him. Do I love the other awliya also? What about um, a suhrawardi what about uh, a Rifai? Uh, what about a Dasuqi? What about al Badawi? What about a Shadili? What about Ibn Ata'ila al Sakandari? What about al Imam al Haddad and the Ba'alawis? Because we have lots of Turuq and we have lots of Shaykhs. So you must love them also. And if you begin to disparage them, even in your heart, in your heart, you're gnawing away at your own silsila. And if, God forbid, we should disparage them publicly, you cut your silsila. Man adali waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb. Whoever offends one of my awliya, God says, I have declared war against. So you don't want to do that. And again, the child na naturally and necessarily loves his or her father. And we boys like to boast about our fathers. And you might even go to someone else and say, my father's better than you, your father. And in my country, we even say, my father could beat up your father. And, uh, and your father said, would you stop saying that, please? You know, if, what do you want to do? Get me in trouble? Okay. Um, but... You know, the murid often will do this about his sheikh. That my sheikh is the best of them all. My sheikh is better than your sheikh. And also, they often will want to compare awrad and to compare ahzab. You should never do that. Because 
First of all, you don't know what they mean. You don't know what stages they represent. You need to begin at the beginning. All these awrad are of no use to you. If you just open the book, you need to be worked up to that state. And then the greatest danger of all is that you will then say that this path is better than that path. You now they're different. You know, but um, you know, you must be very careful. And the same thing about the silsila. In fact, there are sheikhs who won't, won't tell you their silsila because of the great danger that you will compare it to others. Or that you will meet with others who are on the path and they will say, this is our silsila, where is yours? And then you begin to compare and in that you're putting the axe to the tree. This is childish. This is dangerous also. And of course, even in these families with the great and sab, especially Ahlul Bayt, God bless them. I know of many of them, and especially Jilanis like this, and I've known many Jilanis like this, they won't tell their children this, the, the Nesab. I know of one who's very close to me, you know, and he's now passed on years ago. Big Jilani Sheikh. And he wouldn't tell his children their nesib. And they would say, please, tell us the nesib. And he said, what? He said, so you can't marry so-and-so, and you can't marry so-and-so? He said, I want you to be able to marry everybody. And I want you to be open to everyone. And, you know, so he wouldn't show it to them. But uh, in any case, it's very, very important to learn these fine points and to live by them. Then um, we have another question that came up. And in fact, this is the first question that uh, my beloved brother and his wife gave us tonight based on your questions. And we try to come to these, you know, tonight before the time is up. What is the cure? What is the cure? And um, I'm just going to give you some propositions. But when you are traumatized by a false sheikh, what is the cure? And many of us are brothers and sisters. In fact, one of the ironies of the path is that for some people, and sometimes they're some of the greatest of the awliya, they begin their path with a false sheikh. And that becomes the first and biggest test. And it could destroy them forever. But because they are able to escape and to stay alive and to keep their himma and their goal, they will find then the real sheikh. Okay, and, and, and the Sufis write about that. They write about that. And they write about Sufis that begin with a false sheikh. But then that becomes, and they serve him and they love him and they don't know. But then when they discover, they're devastated. Okay, but then that opens the door to the real one. So that's why if you have had a false sheikh or a questionable sheikh, <coughs> don't regard that to be a death knell because it might in fact indicate that you are one of the very best. You will get there, inshallah. But of course the greatest cure of all is to find a true sheikh. To find a true sheikh. And the true sheikh can cure this trauma forever. And in fact, if you have been traumatized by a false sheikh, that's what he will do. He will begin by getting you whole again. It might take three years. It might take more, it might take less. It depends a lot on you, how long the trauma went on, how deep the trauma was. So that would be the cure of cure. That's like the panacea. But what if you can't find such a sheikh? So there, and what if it takes you time to find such a sheikh? And there you want to find the best company you can find and keep it. And you want to look for the believers, the ones you believe in, the ones you can trust, the ones who are not going to use you and abuse you and misuse you and keep their company. And they're a heal, they're a healing they're a therapy as well. Um, don't fixate on that experience. Don't fixate 
on that false sheikh. Just leave him. Now you may have to warn people about him, but don't fixate on him. And don't try to destroy him. If you can pray for him, that would be beautiful. You may not be able to do that because he hurt you bad, and often he hurt other people as well. And that might be the thing that makes it really difficult for you to forgive and forget. But you want to move on. You don't want to remain attached to him, even in the negative sense of remembering how horrible he was and how horrible he may continue to be. Because often they continue to destroy people right and left. And it can be extremely discouraging. But don't fixate on him and don't try to destroy him. And just set out to find the path. Set out to find the real thing. Now, having said that, you also want to make lots of salat on the Prophet. Because when you can't find a shaykh, salat on the Prophet is one of the secrets that gets you there. And when you're in a situation like this, um, Salat on the Prophet is one of the remedies that helps you to find uh, the company that you so desperately need. And maybe, and hopefully, to find the real thing. Now, one of the greatest problems with those who are traumatized on the path, however, is that they can never trust again. And this is where the trauma is really serious. And God bless them and cure them. And I know people like this who lived and died like this. That they loved him. They gave him everything and he betrayed them totally. And they probably didn't even know themselves. In this case, the one I'm thinking of, he remained a Muslim. And a good one. And he worked very hard, but he was never 100% ever. In fact, I don't believe he was even 30%. You know, he could never be. And he saw after that at least half a dozen real sheikhs. But he couldn't take the hand of any of them. He loved them. He visited them, he asked for their du'a, but he could not submit to them. He could not trust them. And one of the rules of the path, one of the qawaid of the path, is that if you don't submit to someone in particular who deserves that, who's worthy of that, meaning a real shaykh, no one will benefit from you and you won't benefit from anyone. This is one of the qawaid of the path, that in order for me to benefit from others, I need to be in submission to my master. Of course, I have to find my master. And what a blessing when you do. God, you can thank. You, you're just filled with thankfulness for the rest of your life. I've got him. I've got him. You know, and he will never let you down. Um, but, you know, uh, the problem is that the person who's been burned and burned and burned bad, they may never trust again. I know two cases in mind, in fact. And one of them, he could never take the hand of a sheikh. Even though, wallahi, he loved and met half a dozen but he couldn't do that. In the end, he took the hand of a false sheikh, of a bigger fraud than the first one. Isn't that strange? But then isn't that a pattern? That people who are abused end up getting abused again, psychologically probably, because they want to bring closure to that. They think that this time I'll do it right. Or this time it won't happen, and it does happen again. And in fact, in his case, 
he took the hand of a false sheikh. I was so sad. And I was angry with him, in fact. Because I said, you never took, I said in my heart, you never took the hands of these real ones. We offered them to you. And then you take the hands of this fool. I'm talking to myself. You know? And then he died. He didn't last with that sheikh very long. I think the sheikh gave him adhkar that killed him, actually. Because the sheikh knew nothing. He was a fraud, a big fraud. And, um, you know, so he died. And I was told by another sheikh that he died as a mercy to God. And that he died as a shaheed. But that he just, he fell back into it. Because this fraud that he fell for had the same psychic energy of the first fraud. The first fraud was a lot bigger and a lot better. But that same psychic energy was there and he fell for it. And God just took his life. But he could have been so much. And he never really, he did so much. But he never was more than 30%. And I know, another, I know another case of a man who, again, was traumatized. And this is one of the most beautiful people I've ever known. And he's one of the greatest I've ever known. Great scholar, great energy. But again, he could never take the hand of a sheikh after that. Even though he will say, so-and-so is my sheikh, so-and-so is my sheikh, so-and-so is my sheikh. But I know they weren't. Because I know him. And he never submitted to them. And he took people as sheikhs also, who are beautiful people, but they're not sheikhs. And, um, you know, so, again, it's like he could just never trust again. And there are many people like that, brothers and sisters, may God guide them and have mercy on them. You know, so this is a very important topic. It's a very dark an unhappy topic. We don't like to talk about it, but we have to. And, um, you know, so, um, I think that's enough said about that. And may God protect us, and may He protect those people, and may He bring the children home. Because actually, out there, there are hundreds, let's say thousands, you know, of people who are either under a false sheikh and they don't know it, but they're not going anywhere. Or they've been under one and they just can't break through. So, inshallah, may God bring the children home. Bi idni lahi ta'ala. Again, the true sheikh, he can put it all back together again. He can put it all back together again. And we pray for such true sheikhs that can set things right and bring things back to where they ought to be. So, I'm sorry we've taken a lot of time on this, but I hope that that wasn't a waste of time in any way. So tonight we want to come to a new lesson. And our lesson tonight is about the awliya. Um, the path to God is the path of Ihsan. That's the greatest path of all. Um, and um, Sufism is the science of that path. Now, that path is also the path of sainthood. It's the path of wilaya. So we need to talk about wilaya, and we need to talk about the saint, and that's what we will talk about tonight with God's help. And may God forgive us for speaking about things that we know so little about, actually. But the saint and sainthood are absolutely primary. And they are, are of course, um, what the path is all about. They're what the path is all about. So setting out on the path is the blessed journey to get close to God, to get near to God. And this is the path of sainthood from the very beginning because Every believer is a saint. Isn't that true? Every believer is a saint. There's not a person here who's not a saint. There's not a person here who's not a wali of Allah. Or a wali of Allah. But they have different degrees. They have different gifts. They have different levels. Um, and wilaya is the path 
And it is the essence of the path, from the beginning to the end, from the lowest wilaya, the most, we should say, elemental wilaya, to the highest wilaya of all. And we want to go as high as we can go. It is valid to say that sainthood is the world of Sufism, and it is the end, the goal, of that world and the saint is the concentrated essence of the Dean he or she embodies it perfectly beautifully and we find this embodiment in the great Sufi sheikhs or the great awliya like we find it nowhere else they are such gifts of God. They are the heirs of the Prophet. However, beware. If you set, on, set out on the path to seek wilaya, you've got no path. So you are a wili. You are a wiliya. You're a believer. You're beautiful. But if you seek on the path to gain wilaya, and to be known as a wali, you've fallen off the mountain, or you've fallen off the horse, or the donkey. You know, inshallah you get back on, and you're not killed, you know, by the fall. But, um, so, uh, wilaya is what we want to talk about tonight. And um, before I do that, let's emphasize something, which makes me happy to emphasize. Saints are both men and women, right? No question about that. In fact, uh, it's usually said, often said, that women are the best friends of religion. The most sincere, honest, hard-working friends of religion are women. And that's the way it was with our blessed Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's the way it is with Christians and Jews and everybody else. The women are so sincere. So we say that women are the best friends of religion, but religion is not always their best friends. May it be that way. And inshallah, I hope it's true to say that with the Sufis, they know the value of women. Okay, and they honor women. I hope that that is as true as it can possibly be. So, women have a prominence in Islam. And I have a series of tapes, 14 CDs, each probably an hour long, called Famous Women in Islam. And you can get it online. And I do talk about the Sufi women, but I just show that in everything we had prominent women in Islam. In fact, no civilization on earth can compete with us in that regard, in my opinion. And of course, women are prominent in modern secular society, but that doesn't mean that they don't face a thousand obstacles and problems. Okay, and they themselves are not happy with what has been attained so far. So, women do have an honored place in Islam. It should be more common than it is. And it is a fard ayn, uh, excuse me, a farkifaya, a societal obligation, that women get religious knowledge and master it, uh, just like men. And uh, you can get that in your fiqh books. You know, that's very, very clear. But the role of women is very, very prominent in Sufism. And most of those women are anonymous, by the way, just as most of the Sufis are anonymous. And therefore, when you study the lives of the great Sufis, Dhu uh, Nun al-Misri and so many others, uh, there will always be stories about women saints. And the women saints will come in to correct them and to teach them. There are many stories like that. And, um, of course, we have also a number that are well known, like Rabia al-Adawiyya. And this is one of the great ones, and she is not one of. The, he's not, not the only one. Not in her time. She's early. She's in the second century. She's in the very beginning of Sufism, uh, when it was a name, 
when it became the name, but she was the reality. And uh, Rabia is, of course, incredible beyond words. And we all love her. And we love the mention of her name. Um, um, she lived in the times of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and his father Muhammad al-Baqir. Uh, she loved, lived in the time of Shayban al-Ra'i, Ma'ruf al-Karhi, Ibrahim al-Adham, Fudayl ibn Iyad, whom we talked about yesterday. So these are all roughly contemporaries in that beautiful second century. And then in that century and into the next century, we have another great one who is a Sayyid Nafisa bint al-Hasan al anwar So we have to mention her. And we could go on and on to mention the great Sufi women. But um, they are really amazing. So the Sufis, at least the ones that I have in mind, you know, they advance very positive views of women. And here we have the whole issue of male and female, man and woman, manliness, and so forth. And then especially we have this word, the rijal, the men, rijal Allah, the men of God. And we talk about muru'ah, manliness, in conjunction with that. And we talk about futua with regard to that too. But it's very important that the Sufis in their understanding of muru'ah, of manliness, and of futuwa, of chival, chival, chivalrous, youthfulness, and also of uh, the rijal, they don't regard that as gender specific. They don't regard that as gender specific. So let's talk about that a little bit, okay? Rumi, may God be pleased with him. He said, most men are women. And he, the Sufis would talk about a positive concept of woman and a negative. And they'll talk about a positive concept of man and a negative. So Pharaoh is the negative man. Uh, his wife, Asya, is the positive. But he says, most women, men are women in men's bodies. But he means in the negative sense of the feminine principle. In the negative sense of the feminine principle. He said, in the case of Mary, she was Rustam, hidden in a woman's body. So Rustam is the great Persian hero, the great chivalrous figure, and warlike figure, and manly figure of ancient Persia. And Ruby writes in Persian, as you know. So he says that Mary was Rustam, in a, in a woman's body. And um, in fact, in one etymology, one of the things we know about the word Maryam, which is a Hebrew word, is that it is a dual. Uh, Hebrew is Middle Semitic. Arabic is Ancient Semitic. Arabic is much older than Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, all these other languages. But Maryam is a dual. It's a Hebrew dual. And the Hebrews lost the dual. But some say that Maryam means two men. It means two men. You know, that she's, she's worth more than two men. And we say also in the Sufi tradition that there are women who are worth more than 40 men. Um, Rumi says, a man is someone who possesses the qualities of manliness and chivalry. And those qualities can be possessed by women just as they can be possessed by men. Um, Khwaja Abdullah Ansari, who's one of the great awliya of Allah, um, of that in those early centuries, he says, manliness is to lose yourself to your ego and to live in yourself with God. And he says, God says, be with those who stand firmly in justice. He says also, the pillars of manliness are three. To live with yourself in intellect. In other words, to use your intellect in the way that you live your life with yourself. Manliness is intellect, and not all men have intellect. And women have intellect like men. They also have that. So 
he says that manliness um, is to live with yourself in intellect, to live with created beings, especially human beings, in patience, to be halim, and to be patient. And it is to live with God through utter need, iltirar. We talked about yesterday that. that the, the, the wali should always be in a state of iltirar, complete dependence of God. And then they say, uh, perhaps this is Khwaja Abdullah, but my notes are not clear. In reality, very few people deserve to be called men. And some women do. Um, in the positive, normative sense of the word. Many should be called men in the negative sense of the word. For a man in the negative sense is one whose soul is dominated by the fiery qualities proper to Iblis. Because Iblis is a manifestation of the male principle in its negative form. Just as the nefs, the ego, is a manifestation of the feminine principle in its negative form. Hmm. So the Rijal are both genders. Ibn Arabi, may God be pleased with him, constantly uses the term Rajul, Rajulullah and Rijalullah, uh, the man of God or the men of God. Uh, and he's careful to point out that it is not gender specific. In other words, it refers to women too. And not just because you're a male doesn't mean that you're worthy of that word. Um, he will teach us that the human being is purified through the light of intellect. They always stress this, intellect, al-aql, and guidance after having emerged from the darkness of nature, of your nature, your fitrah, and caprice. Um, we then reach a state where we could be called man. I hope I could be called that, and you too. It's not gender specific. The perfection of manliness, here rujuliya is the word that he's using, lies in what we have mentioned, whether that person is male or female. Uh, he notes that the abdal, and we might talk, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, the substitutes as they're called. They're called substitutes because when one dies, another one comes. The abdal may include women. Now, the Sufis might have disagreed on that. Ibn Arabi didn't. Uh, he held that the abdal may include women, though usually they are men. And he cites proof that there may be women among the abdal, even. The achievement of manliness, and then also of rujura, of that manliness, of muru'ah, and of chivalry, um, that verges always on the achievement of human perfection, uh, which is connected again with full activity of the intellect, the intellect in charge, and the full receptivity of the soul towards God. Okay, and this we call the perfect balance of the male and female principles. So in the rajul of God and in the person of manliness or of chivalry, the male and female principles are balanced. And that's why also you on your path, the idhni lahi ta'ala, even if we live in difficult times and even if we live in societies that are dominated by male egos and think by the negative male ego, uh, you can still get it right. You can still balance it out. Many women saints are people of great masculinity, but in a positive sense. There are great women. Um, and early Sufi literature has many accounts of women who have this masculinity. And I don't mean that they had beards or they had mustaches in a, or anything like that, but I mean that they were rijalullah. They were men of God. Probably shouldn't use the word masculinity here, should I? <laughs> in any case, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, he said that the wife of one of the awliya of his time, um, his name was Sidi Ahmed al -Khad ibn al-Khadruya, uh, al 
He said that if someone wants to see a man hidden in women's clothing or in a woman's body, then let him, let him look at Fatima. Because this is one Rijalullah. By calling a woman a man, the Sufis meant to show that she, as the Wali of Allah, had attained to the fullness of the human state in which the soul, the nafs, serves the intellect and therefore serves the heart and serves the spirit. One can hardly be a perfect woman without being a perfect human being. A female can be fully female only when she is also a man in that sense, meaning that she's got the male principle in place and the female principle in place. And the same thing's true of the man. He can only be a man when he has the positive female principle in its right place. And forgive me if this is obscure. Forgive me if this is not clear. Um, and we say that she too is made in God's image though her outward form, through her outward form, though her outward form often manifests God's love, beauty, mercy, kindness, and gentleness more directly than men, but she's also that image of God. Mary was perfectly feminine. Who is a greater mother than she? The mother of the Messiah. Okay, so Mary was perfectly feminine, yet she's also perfectly masculine in this sense without any way compromising her femininity. Uh, Attar, who's one of the great poets of the Sufis, he says, when tomorrow on the day of resurrection, the call goes up, O men, ya rijal, the first person to step into the ranks of the men will be the Virgin Mary. Um, there was one of the great uh, Sufis of the fourth century, um, she's actually the sister of uh, Hussein ibn Mansur. I'm not going to tell you his last name because I don't want that to come up yet. But she was the sister of Hussein ibn Mansur. And um, they say that Hussein ibn Mansur had a sister who laid claim to manliness on the path. Now, whether she should have done that or not, I don't know. but. You, we can talk about her brother and talk about her too. Um, and she was also beautiful. Um, and when she would come into Baghdad, she would come with half of her face covered and the other half exposed. Um, we don't want to get into veiling, but often the beautiful woman was expected to cover her face. Um, but she would do it halfway. And um, a particular illustrious person came up to her and said, why do you not cover your face entirely? And she replied, show me a man and I will cover my face. <laughs> she said, in all of Baghdad, there is only half of a man. And that's my brother. Were it not for him, I would leave even that half uncovered. <laughs> These are actually beautiful stories. I mean, really they are, and there's so much life and there's so much humor in this. Again, futua, let's say a few words about that, because chivalry, uh, futua is such an important part of Islam. And, you know, I hope this is not out of place, but, um, you know, futua is something we really need. Futua is the chivalry of youthfulness. And, of course, you have the feta the youthful, and you have the feta, the chivalrous young maiden. Both of them come from Futua. And young people have to be put to work. And I don't want to talk about extremism and violence, because that's not what we're here to talk about. But the fact is that I know a person, and some of you do as well, who's one of the murids, who is a master of Aikido. And he's from Indonesia. And Aikido is, is a martial art that uses spirituality, and especially the spirituality of loving your opponent. And he can do things you cannot believe. I've seen it. I've seen it. 
And he actually uses this to rehabilitate extremists in Jakarta who are ready to go to join ISIS. And he has to win their confidence, but he has to get them to train with him. And, you know, sometimes they come and go and often they doubt him. But in the end, he has rehabilitated dozens of them. And how does he do that? Because he shows them the truth of spirituality. Now, one of the things he has said, and this is why I wanted to bring this up, is that we have got to reinitiate Futua. Because these young people, you know, we say, Shababu Shu'abatun Min Al Junoon, that youthfulness is one of the branches of insanity. You've got to give them something to do. And you can't just give them words and you can't just give them knowledge. They need to be in projects. They need to be doing things. And he trains them in Aikido. And actually training them in martial arts, this is an Islamic tradition. And in martial arts, you have to be a man. In this sense, you have to be noble. You know? And also you have to take an oath that you won't misuse this art. But we've got to bring back the... Uh, tradition of Futua and we've got to engage our young men and women in the kind of positive dynamic projects that are done in the name of Futua and this is a very important part of our Islamic history but what is Futua and here I'm going to give the definition of the great Sufi master al Qushayri. <clears throat> al Qushayri says the root of futua, of chivalry, youthful chivalry, we should say, is that the servant of God strive constantly to serve others for their sake. Adab, service, and love. This is it. The root of futua is that the servant of God strive constantly to serve them for the sake of... that he's excuse me, that he constantly strives to serve uh, for the sake of others. He strives constantly for the sake of others. He's always working for others, serving others. Futua is that you do not see yourself as superior to anyone. Again, we talked about that yesterday. This is what? This is husnul khuluq, isn't it? This is good character. These are the two elements of good character. The one who has futua is the one who has no enemies. And we in the path of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, like these other great mashayikh, this is our goal. I don't want a single enemy. I don't want to count anyone as my enemy. And even the people who do things we don't like, I don't want him to be my enemy. We want to win them over. And as Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani would say, you know, at talihuna li, the unrighteous are mine, give them to me. I'll work with them. Nobody else wants them. We'll work with them. Futuwa is that you be an enemy to your nafs for the sake of your Lord. Futuwa is that you act justly without demanding justice for yourself. Do justice to others and don't demand it for yourself. That's incredible, isn't it? In fact, Adab you never require adab of anybody but me, myself, and I. You know, we don't say, brother, that's bad adab. Sister, that's bad adab. That's one of the signs of the false sheikh. That's one of the signs of the false sheikh. This is bad adab. How do you dare to ask that question? They'll never say that. They'll, they don't say that. You ask yourself for adab. Where's my adab? And as like we said, you want to know if he has adab? Come up and treat him with no adab at all. Come up and be rude. And then if he has adab, he will respond beautifully. And so will she. Um, Futuwa is beautiful character. That's what he says. Let's take one more. Most people are women in the negative sense. If we look at the dumb, most women, most people are women in the negative sense. And women, forgive me for saying that, but we have negative masculinity, negative femininity, okay? And I know that that needs to be explained and gone through, and it, it's very metaphysical. We had a zawi on it last summer, and then we decided don't ever do metaphysics again. So this year it will be tending 
the earth living, the art of living with God's creation, which is about husbandry, animals, farms. It's actually metaphysical. The lowest metaphysical principle is stewardship of the earth. But we're not going to say that this time. <laughs> Maybe I will. Yeah, I can't, I, can't, I can't help but do it. I love metaphysics even though I know nothing about it. So, if we look at the dominant qualities of most people from the point of view of the Islamic tradition, the Sufi tradition maybe I should say, they are women in the bad sense. Forgive me. They are women since they are passive towards the pig, the dog, and the Satan within them. That means the negative qualities of the ego. The pig is appetite, out of control. And the dog is anger, out of control. <clears throat> and the Satan is even greater than that. Okay? I have a Yazid in my nefs, right? I have a Yazid in this heart. And if I can't take care of that Yazid, I'll never be able to understand the secrets of Abu Yazid al-Bistami. We talked about that yesterday. From the qualitative perspective, the fact that, quote, women fall short in intelligence and religion, you know, in, as it comes in the hadith, um, you know, intellect and religion are the hallmarks of guidance. And women in the negative sense are like that, but not in the positive sense. And the Sufis go into that in great detail, and I probably shouldn't have mentioned that. It's going to be a hundred questions, but don't try to hook me. Let me off the hook. Okay, so, um, therefore, uh, you know, as we said before, uh, the issue of the awliya is very, very important. And may God. Now, um, again, we come back before we talk more about the awliya. Um, to talk about the stigma against Sufism. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that uh, here it's really important for us to develop a sound understanding of the awliya also, what they are and how they are. And um, I'm going to leave it at that. I was actually going to say something else, but. Then I decided that we've only got an hour left. We don't even have an hour left, right? So I should get on task. So let's talk a little bit about sainthood and the awliya. Then we want to talk about the sheikh and the murid. I don't know how far we'll get, but we've got two more classes. Um, so as we've said, the awliya are hidden. Okay, and so allow me to repeat that again. And we said that min kamal al awliya min kamal al anbiya al zuhur wa min kamal al awliya al khafa part of the perfection of the awliya of the prophets is appearance they are known outwardly and part of the perfection of the awliya is that they are hidden so we're repeating it for the third or fifth time i don't know but i want to do that and then also i want to repeat again the words of abu madian al ghawth that al ghayra and ta'rif wa la ta'raf that defensive honor is that you know God but not be known be hidden so let's talk about that um, at Tirmidhi transmits a hadith in which the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam let me give you the hadith in English I have the Arabic here but we don't have time if you forgive me he says God says the most to be envied of my awliya, um, and that, as you know, is aghbat awliya'i. Yani, inna aghbat awliya'i, indi. So this is Hadith Qudsi. God says, the most envied of my awliya, or the most to be envied, and this is in a positive sense, as you know. The most to be envied of my awliya is indeed a believer who is of limited means and burdens. The Arabic here is khafiful haz. Khafiful haz. It means that he doesn't have much, and also he doesn't have much burden on him. He doesn't have a huge family and so forth. So he's poor, but he doesn't have a whole lot anyway. So he's free in his poverty. 
He's not always wondering, how am I going to feed all those children? How am I going to feed this family? So he is khafiful haz. He is um, of limited means and burdens. Maybe I should say responsibilities. Um, and I'm just going to put that in, if you don't mind. Uh, responsibilities. Um, who has been gifted in prayer. Uh, that's not a good translation, but vuhazin um, vuhazin mina sola. So I put here, he's been gifted in prayer, but it means that he's able to pray well. He loves to pray. You know, God's given him the ability to pray and to love it. So he loves to pray. He's good at prayer. And you can help me with the translation. You know, I, I would appreciate that very much. And uh, translation is dangerous, isn't it? Because we're saying, this is what the Prophet said? And what if that's not what he said? So, God forgive me, pray for me. Um, who's gifted in prayer. He worships his Lord well and obeys him in secret. Actually, it should be, in secret, he worships his Lord well and obeys him. So, secret. He loves to be hidden. He is obscure among the people. This is the hadith. Uh, no one points to him with their fingers. Oh, that's Sheikh so-and-so. Oh, that's sister so-and-so. No one does that. They don't point to him with their fingers. His provision is only the bare necessities. But he endures with patience. Then... And the Prophet dusted off his hands and said, when his end comes, when it's hastened, few are those who cry for him. And little is the inheritance that he leaves behind. So he's unknown. And these are the most to be envied of all God's servants. And these are most of the awliya. Most of the awliya, and these great awliya who appear in history, you know, like a Tasuqi, al Badawi, a Shadili, um, a Rifai, al Qutb al Ghauth, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Tilani, a Naqshabandi, and uh, Bahauddin al Naqshaband, and others, they are like mountains or like icebergs that appear, you know, but they are there for the mercy of the people, and even when they appear. They are mostly hidden. Do you think that people like me have any idea what the reality of al-Badawi was? Or of Ibn Ata'Allah? Or al-Shadili? Or Ibn Mashish? We love them. We love them, but they also are hidden. And what is exposed of them is like the tip of the iceberg. But they do that for the, the mercy of God. Then let's take another hadith. And this is a hadith, um, it's from Ibn Majah and from Al-Bazar, and it's from Kitab Al-Fitan. Uh, the, other, the other one was at tirmidhi The other one was taken from at tirmidhi But, um, and this is in Kitab Al-Fitan. And this is a story, and it says that Sayyidina Umar, after the Prophet's death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went to the Prophet's mimbar. Um, apparently at night, although the hadith doesn't say that, but he went to the Prophet's mimbar. And then he saw Mu'adh ibn Jabal at the Prophet's grave. And as all of you know, the Prophet's mimbar is not far from the Prophet's grave. So he goes to the mimbar. Again, why would he do that? For barakah. For barakah. They believed in these things. So he goes to the Prophet's mimbar, probably at night, probably to pray. And then he looks and he sees Mu'adh ibn Jabal at the Prophet's grave crying. And so he went to him and he said, Why are you crying, Mu'adh? He said, and Mu'adh replied, I am crying because of something I heard Sahib had al Qabr say. Something I heard the man buried here say. And what is that? These are the words of the Prophet in this hadith. Even a little bit of riya is shirk. Um, the Arabic is, Inna yasiran min al-riya'i shirk. 
that even a little bit of riya is shirk. And whoever offends one of the awliya, whoever offends, I'm sorry, uh, this text is a little bit different. Whoever offends the awliya of God has come out on the battlefield in war against God. فَقَدْ بَارَزَ Allah bil. Uh, what does he say in the text? فَقَدْ بَارَزَ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى بِالْمُحَارَبَةِ That's how the text goes. He's come out on the battlefield against God in war. Uh, truly, God loves the righteous. And this is why I mentioned that. Truly, God loves the righteous who are hidden among the people. Um, again, it's... Um, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْأَبْرَارِ الْأَخْفِيَاءَ الْأَتْقِيَاءَ Maybe my translation is not that good, not that exact. Uh, they are those who, if they are absent, no one looks for them. Where is so-and-so tonight? We don't even think of him, because he's one of the biggest awliya there are. I'm sure even in our group, there are people, I believe this about certain people, they are much greater than myself, for sure. And no one would even pay attention to them. As one person in particular, I think this of, among our beloved brothers from this wonderful country. You know, when they're absent, no one looks for them. And if they are present, they will not be called upon and are not known. Uh, who is that? Who is he? Their hearts are radiant lamps of guidance. Their hearts are radiant lamps of guidance. Let's look at the Arabic here. He says, um, Okay, so what does that mean? It means, brothers and sisters, their hearts are radiant lamps of guidance. My God, who are these people? Their hearts are all the awliya like this, especially these ones. Their hearts are radiant lamps of guidance, and they keep it all to themselves. And they get it more and more and more, and they have a special role in creation. They will find a way out of every dark and difficult tribulation. So also, it's good to have him as your friend or her. Because whenever tribulation comes, يَخْرُجُونَ مِنْهَا And غَبْرَاء uh, مُظْلِعَ means really difficult tribulation. Really trouble, troublesome situation. So the awliya are great. And of course, we believe in the awliya. That is obligatory in the deen. You must believe in the awliya. You must also believe in their karamat. You don't have to believe in all the stories you hear. But you must believe generically that the awliya have karamat. Um, who are the awliya? Well, every believer. Allahu waliyu ladina amanu. God is wali. God is the wali of those who believe, and um, they are also his awliya. So, um, the awliya have degrees and they have hierarchies. And every one of you who is a beautiful believer, and I believe every one of you is like that. You belong to them. You're also among the awliya. <clears throat> Um, Ibn Abbas transmits that a man asked, O Messenger of God, this is in Ibn Majah in Kitab al Zuhud, and Ibn Abbas transmits that a man asked, O Messenger of God, who are the awliya? And the Prophet answered, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those who, if they are seen, God is called to mind. So, this is also one of the things about them, is that. Just looking at them is good for your heart. It makes you think of God. And again, you know, like the hidden ones, it's one of the ways that you can expose them. Because even though nobody knows them, but every time I look at him, I feel so good. Every time I'm around her in a positive sharia way, I am elevated. Okay, so they are people who make you remember God because they are in total remembrance of God. 
they are in total remembrance of God. Um, the awliya are among God's greatest general mercies. If it were not for them, we would be in trouble. And we would have been destroyed a long time ago. And when God wills to destroy the world at the end of time, what does he do? He takes away all the believers, right? So that no believer is left on earth. And that means none of the awliya are left. And then the world can't last very long. They are like the breath of the world. And this is Sufi talk, but they do have reason to say that. Um, so, Ibn Abi al transmits in his history. That's where this hadith comes from. But Imam al Nawawi has a hadith similar to this. That um, the Prophet said, Lawla ibadun rukka'un. Okay, so he said, if it were not for worshippers bowing in prayer and nurslings, babies, at their mother's breasts and animals grazing, baha'im, um, rutta, animals grazing, the punishment would be sent down upon you in torrents. So uh, this is very important because these people who are ibadun rukka, they bow in prayer, they worship God, they love Him, and then the babies, nursing, and the animals, these are means of rahmah. And uh, if the world were all like most of us are, truly sisters and brothers, we wouldn't have a chance. Um, so again, they're, they're, God, they're God's mercy. Imam Ahmed, God be pleased with him, transmits this hadith from Anas ibn Malik in his Musnad. And in this hadith, actually, uh, it says that the Prophet um, said, it said that the Prophet said, when the Abdal had been mentioned. So that's what this hadith says. And again, we talked about that a little bit yesterday, that you have another transmission from the Prophet, which is the wiqr that Abu Huraira tells us about in Bukhari and in other sources. And that one's not to be given out publicly. The Sufis say that's where, you get, that's where they get their knowledge. And also people would say that that's where the fitan really are, that the, the detailed information about the hypocritical ruler or the hypocritical tyrant, or hypocritical scholar, or so many things. Ibn Hajar, to, and given my weak memory, I think that's actually his interpretation of it, that this is the wiqr that has in it uh, the information about the bad people and the bad things that are going to happen, ashratu sa'a and things like that in detail. Uh, for example, it would no doubt tell us the truth about Yazid and probably tell us the truth about Imam al Hussein. And when Imam al Hussein was, was martyred, um, they knew it was going to happen. That had been foretold. So, in any case, um, the Abdal and these Autad and so forth that the Sufis talk about, um, I have heard from great muhaddiths, great muhaddiths, that it goes back that the muhaddithin did not deny that. But they know that that's not in their books. It's in the other transmission. And they honored it, therefore. And here in Imam Ahmed, you see a sign of that. So he said that the Sahaba were talking about the Abdal, the substitutes. And the Prophet said, whenever one of them dies, God substitutes another one of the believers for him in his place. By them, and this is why I gave you the Hadith, by them, God gives life to the dead. And by them, God diverts catastrophes from earth. And by them, God makes the living die. And by them, he brings water to the barren land. Okay, so again, that would need commentary, and I can't give that to you. 
right now. I don't want to, if you'll allow me. But again, these are people who are fundamental to the working of the world. They play a big, and you know, they give life to us. They bring, and that can be metaphorical. The Quran often uses it that way. They bring our hearts to life, and you know, they bring water to the land. They are what keep us well. They asked, O Messenger of God, by what did they attain this? And this is also why I wanted to mention this hadith, because you can see this repeated in the great Sufis that we've mentioned. Al-Junaid, Al-Nuri, um, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad. Okay, so they say, O oh, Messenger of God, by what did they attain this? Was it... <coughs> I have to take some water. <coughs> Was it by fasting and prayer? <coughs> and he said, By him in whose hand is my soul, they did not attain this either by fasting or prayer. <coughs> but they attained it by sakha al-anfus. So that's what we've heard. I love this expression. <coughs> they attained it by overflowing generosity of their souls. Sakha al-anfus, sidq al-hadith, being honest and truthful in their speech, وَسَلَامَةَ الصَّدْرِ وَسَلَامَةَ الصَّدْرِ وَسَلَامَةَ الصَّدْرِ He said it three times. And the soundness of their hearts, and the soundness of their hearts, and the soundness of their hearts. These are the awliya of Allah. And we're not going to talk about abdal and awtad and aqdab. I'm not even going to get there, okay? So don't be bothered by that. <coughs> but um, the awliya, they are hidden. And they are a mercy, and they play a great role. And may God enable us to love them. Um, they are the best of creation. Okay? And what does Allah say? Um, and, you know, Salamat al-Sadr. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ You know, we have to have that sound heart. There is a day when possessions and children will be of no benefit unless you are among those who come to God with a sound heart. And may God make us that way. But the awliya are the best of creation. No doubt about it. Why? Because they're believers. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Truly, those who believe and do good deeds, they are the best of creation. And these are the people who believe in good deeds believe and do good deeds. And it doesn't mean at all that, you know, only the people who think they're Sufis or are trying to be Sufis are those, because that's not true, especially not in this time. And there's so many incredible believers, men and women, you know, who wouldn't have anything to do with the Sufis, quite frankly. And yet they're really good people. Again, the awliya have degrees <coughs> and... Um, you know, I think we've said enough about that for the time being. Um, the awliya have hurma. <clears throat> In fact, um, you know, the dying words of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani to his great son Abdul Razak, who in our line goes through Abdul Razak, and our Sheikh also is a descendant of Abdul Razak. But uh, his dying words to Sidi Abdul Razak were that all you need from this world are two things. Suhbatu wali. Hmm, no. Uh, I've, I think suhbatu faqir. Yeah. Wa hurmatu wali. You need to have the companionship of the poor. And here he really means the poor. Wa hurmatu wali. And the sanctity of a wali. This is all you need. This is all you need from this world. So Al-Bukhari transmits in Kitab al-Riqaq this famous hadith which you all know. But I'm going to give you Bukhari's transmission. Uh, it's not usually the one I use. Muslim has another one. There are other ones. Whoever off offends a wali of mine, 
من أذلي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب البخاري begins with that his riwayah begins with that whoever offends a wali of mine I have declared war against him and this is why although we have to understand why so many Muslims today are frightened of the Sufis and turned off completely about them but we have to understand also what a disaster this is because then when they turn against this whole legacy including the real ones <clears throat> not the charlatans we're against the charlatans we should all be but when they come against all the awliya then unfortunately they're at war with God they're at war with God and look at the disasters that we're living in today and I'm not the one to tell you why because who am I to understand but then aren't there a lot of people and even a lot of perpetrators of these disasters who generally reject the awliya in general Uwais al-Qarani whom we talked about in the first lecture there's no question about his wilaya it's established in Bukhari and Muslim and he is a real person he either belongs to the Sahaba or he belongs to the Tabi'een I put him with the first of the Tabi'een because he did not actually see the Prophet and ISIS blew up his tomb in Iraq with big explosives it's like really did you have to do this did you have to go this far? I mean, w w was this Ikram of Uwais al-Qarani? Even if you don't believe in building on tombs, and that is a fiqh issue. The fuqaha have different opinions about that. Why don't you study them? But even if you don't believe in that, you know, did you have to blow it up like that? Um, I mean, is this going to bring us good? This is war against God and His Messenger. This is war. So, whoever offends a wali of mine, I have declared war against him. My servant does not draw near me by anything dearer to me than what I have made obligatory upon him. And he does not continue to draw closer to me by voluntary deeds of good until I love him. And of course, her also. When and I love him, I become the hearing with which he hears, the sight with which he sees, the hand with which he smites. Yaptish, that's the word that's used here. And uh, the foot with which he walks. Truly, if he asks me for anything, I will surely give it to him. And if he takes refuge in me, I am going and if he takes refuge in me, I will surely give it to him. There is nothing that I am going to do which I am more hesitant to do than taking the soul of the believer. And in Arabic, وَمَا تَرَدَّتُ عَنْ شَيْءٍ أَنَا فَاعِلُهُ تَرَدُّدِي عَنْ نَفْسِ الْمُؤْمِنِ Okay. Um, he said, there is nothing that I am going to do which I hesitate about that's my translation of taraddud more than taking the soul of the believer in death he dislikes death and I dislike making him unhappy I dislike making him unhappy so this is a beautiful hadith and again we could take the other hadith like it but I cited this here because of hurmat al-wali they have a huge hurma. God loves them. He doesn't even want to take the man's soul or the woman's soul at the end of her life because they don't like to die. You don't want to die. And neither do I. And he doesn't want to make you unhappy. He doesn't want to make you unhappy. So you honor them too. We have to honor them. And this is the position of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We have to honor them. And in that comes all success. And when we don't do that, God help us. Let's take another hadith about <coughs> the hurma of the awliya. Muslim transmits in his Sahih from Aid ibn Amr that Abu Sufyan came upon Salman al Farisi, Salman, Suhaib, and Bilal. That, and this is before Abu Sufyan becomes a Muslim. But Muslim says that there was 
Salman was there, Suhaib was there, Bilal was there. Obviously, this is in Medina. It's at the end, you know, before the conquest of Mecca, just before that, before Abu Sufyan becomes a Muslim. That's what I should say. And um, so Abu Bakr, he, they were there. And, um, you know, and they said, ما أخذت سيوف الله من عنقي عدو الله ما أخذها This is what they said to Abu Sufyan. Have not the swords of God taken their share of the neck of God's enemy? Meaning Abu Sufyan. He's the enemy. He's the head of the enemy. So that you're still alive? And Abu Bakr, who is a Sayyid of Quraysh, he didn't like that at all. And he replied, do you say this to the Shaykh of Quraysh and their Sayyid? I mean, after all, Salman's a Persian, Bilal's an Abyssinian, Suhaib is a Rumi, you're not even Arabs. You know, and so you dare to say this to the Shaykh of Quraysh and to their Sayyid? And then he came to the Prophet and told the Prophet Wasallam what he had said. And the Prophet said to him, Abu Bakr, perhaps you have angered them. He said, perhaps you have angered them. Um, if you have angered them, you have angered their Lord. If you have angered Salman and Suhaib and Bilal, you have angered God. See, this is the same thing. This is that hurma. And so Abu Bakr came back to them and said, Ya ikhwatahu. Oh, brothers, ya ikhwatahu. Did I anger you? And they said, no, God forgive you, our brother. Okay, this is beautiful. And this is sahih, sahih, sahih. If you anger them, you anger God. And again, brothers and sisters, we talked about cutting your silsila. You don't want to anger any of the awliya of God. And you don't want to anger any of the people who are following the turaq that is sahih. And it's not just ours, and it's not just theirs. There are many, you know, so don't anger them. And be respectful. Be respectful in all that you do. Be idni lahi ta'ala. How are we doing for time? Not very well, I fear. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So I'm going to mark this spot and then consider whether I should come back to it. To here. I'll put that there. Um, I was going to talk about khususiya and bashariya. Mm -hmm the humanness of the wali and the khususiyah. I wanted to talk about trusts. Um, I wanted to talk about karamat, but I'm going to skip that now. Maybe we'll come back to it later because we don't have much time and I want to begin to talk about the important issue of the sheikh and the murid, which I presume we're going to continue with tomorrow. So this is something very, very important. And... Um, so we want to talk about some of the principles that are there. First of all, um, the validity of the Sheikh murid relationship, that's really in the relationship between Jibreel and the Prophet. And in fact, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and between Jibreel and all the Prophets. That's where that comes from. But let's not talk about that right this minute. Even before that, when we talk about the Sheikh Murid relationship, we want to talk about uh, Suhba because the path is a path of Suhba, of companionship, and of seeking the best companionship that you can have. And this is an imperative in the Quran and the Sunnah. So I want to begin with that because the path is Suhba, and it is, I believe, the most beautiful manifestation of Suhba and the most complete manifestation of suhba that could ever be. But let's talk about suhba first. The imperative of keeping the best company. Not just good company, the best company. Allah says in the Quran, Kunu ma'as sadiqeen. Be with the speakers of truth. Be with the truthful people. And um, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تصحب إلا مؤمنا 
وَلَا يَأْكُلْ طَعَامَكَ إِلَّا تَقِي This is in Imam Ahmad. Uh, only keep the company of a believer. And may none eat your food but a righteous person. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about this and we don't have time anyway. It doesn't mean that you can't open your house to all the beautiful people and people that are not. But if you're keeping the company of the believers, when you do feed them, it'll be believers. It'll be believers. That's my understanding of it. So we don't want to take that, don't, uh, and, and may none eat your food but a righteous person. We don't want to understand that to mean that we shouldn't be totally generous and feed people. And in fact, one of the greatest things the awliya have done historically is feed people. And Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he says that I investigated all the types of good that you can do, and I found nothing equal to feeding the poor. And he said, if I had all the world of wealth, I would feed the poor. And in many Sufi traditions, I th I'm sure you had this, probably still have it in Egypt, I don't know enough about your beautiful country. But certainly in parts of the Muslim world you can go where you still have these Sufi kitchens. And uh, in the subcontinent you have many of them. And I've been in them, they are incredible. And they are feeding the people three meals a day. And they don't ask, who are you? Are you a Muslim? Are you a Hindu? Are you a Buddhist? Are you an atheist? They don't ask, are you Sunni? Are you Shi'i? No, are you hungry? They don't even ask that. Because if you just want to eat, come and eat. And this is, this is deen. This is so beautiful. This is also futua. This is also chivalrous, to feed the poor, to take care of the homeless, and things like that. So that's my understanding of it, you know, but keep the company, try only to keep the company of the believer. Again, you've got your family, and in them are believers, but there may be in them people that are not so easy. So, and you have to keep their company too. And we have our friends and so forth, and friends of friends. Um, Bukhari transmits in Kitab al-Adab Al-Mar'u ma'a man ahab wa lahu maktasab So he says that a man is, or I would like to say in English, shall be with the one whom he loves. And again, a man is also a woman here. A person. A person shall be with the one he or she loves and shall have what he earned. You'll have what you earned, what you did, but you'll be with the one that you loved. And again, we have the verse in the Qur'an that talks about this in Surah Al-Tur. Those who, yani, their progeny are with them in the garden. You know, So they have what they earned, but then you're allowed to be with the greatest of your ancestors. Um, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that um, a man follows the religion of his intimate friend. A man follows the religion of his intimate friend. So let each of you consider carefully whom he takes as an intimate friend. So all the things about Sufism, and especially Sheikh Murid relationship, they are coming out of this. And they are a relatively clear interpretation of it. That who is your Khalil? Who are you going to take as your Khalil? Your friend that you really love and trust. Okay, because you will follow his religion. So let's take somebody who's really worthy of that. Bi idni lahi ta'ala. God says in the Quran, the hadith I have here is from Muslim. And Tirmidhi has like this as well. Uh, uh, let's take Muslims. God will say on the day of resurrection, where are those who loved each other in my majesty? Ayn al mutahabuna li jalali For the sake of my majesty. Um, 
Uh, no, 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 no. Um, I, I've made a mistake here. Okay. But where are those who loved each other in my majesty? This day I will shade them in my shade on a day in which there is no shade but my shade. So again, we want to love each other for the sake of God. And again, this is what the path is all about. Because we take the path, if we do it correctly, in order to know God and to draw close to Him. And therefore, everyone who's with you on that path, or certainly we, a lot of them, they may not all be that way, but you know, they are people who are mutahabuna fillah. They love each other for the sake of God. And, and it's not just that I love you because you're a good person and you believe in God. No, like I love you and I want to be with you because I'm seeking God and so are you. So what good companions we are and what better companions could we find? Um, in the other hadith, God says, glorious and the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God says, glorious and majestic be he, those who love each other in my majesty, shall have platforms of light. That's my translation of manabir. I prefer platforms to pulpits. Pulpits, very Christian. And uh, so when I, as a Christian, think of the pulpit, I think of a particular type of pulpit, and I'm not sure that that's what was meant. Uh, the prophet's minbar wasn't like that. So it was a platform. So um, God says, glorious and majestic be he, those who love each other in my majesty shall have platforms of light and shall be coveted by the prophets and the martyrs. Coveted, you know, envied in that positive sense. Um, Imam Malik transmits in the Muatta. God says, blessed and exalted be he. My love has been become incumbent for those who love each other for me, who sit together for me and who exert themselves, al uh, exert themselves, give, they give of themselves, I should say, and visit each other for me. So all of these are principles of Islam, and they're general. They're not specific in any way to the Sufis or the path of Ihsan, but they are adopted with absolute seriousness as principial, in the Sufi path. And then, of course, we have also the hadith, which I'm not going to go into, but which the Sufis always talk about, and others do as well. And this is Al-Arwahu Junudun Mujannada, that the spirits of human beings are soldiers marshaled in many ranks. Those of them who recognize each other shall come together in harmony. And those that do not recognize each other will divide in discord. They will divide in discord. Okay, so this is again one of the realities of the path that insha'Allah, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, we are among those people who knew each other there and we recognize each other here, and therefore we love each other. And we can work in harmony. We can solve our problems. And that's one of the main things that the path is seeking to do, is to bring together these people who were together in that world. And we say they, they, they did tawaf together around the throne of God in the world before you know, for eons and eons. It, it, only the believers are truly brothers. So it's also a reflection of that. <clears throat> In other transmissions of this hadith, by the way, it says that the spirits of human beings are soldiers marshaled in many ranks. Tatufu uh, bilayl. They rove in the night, فَمَاتَ عَرَفَ minha ittalaf. They rove about in the night, visiting each other. I don't really know what that means. Of course, they were together, yatufuna, in the other world. But it says, tatufu bilayl. They also rove about at night. In another, it says, 
فَمَا تَعَارَفَ مِنْهَا فِي ذَاتِ اللَّهِ And again, the turuq of hadith are always useful. But it says, those who recognize each other, and of course, ta'arafa is past tense. And we can use it for present tense. But it means they recognized each other, that is, they came to know each other in ذَاتِ I don't know how to translate that, the essence of God, but meaning that there in the hadra of God, before the throne of God, that's where they came to know each other. Um, the next thing that we want to talk about is the Shaykh and the Murid. We have only, you know, um, a few minutes left, right? Seven minutes. So I think we can begin it. And inshallah, we'll see where we go from there. But the basis of this relationship between Shaykh and Murid, um, this Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Tilani tells us, and others tell us, is taken from the Sunnah of Revelation in the relationship between the angel Gabriel and the prophets, and especially in the relationship we know about intimately between our prophet Muhammad and the angel Gabriel. So the angel Gabriel is his Shaykh. The angel Gabriel is the messenger of God to him bringing him the Qur'an and everything else, and telling him what, how to sit, how to eat, how to do everything. And uh, the Prophet takes from Gabriel. And in fact, the silsila of the path, which is so important, is the silsila that goes back to Gabriel. It connects you through the Prophet to Gabriel himself. And um, then, the companions in their relationship to the Prophet have a very similar relationship. And again, we can't say Shaykh and Murid because it's Prophet and Sahaba. But as you've heard said in khutbas and lessons many times in your life, the Sahaba were called Sahaba, companions, because of suhba, because of companionship weren't they? Because of companionship. And this is what the path is all about. And in fact, the path is suhba. We just talked about the hadith of that. So the companions have a special relationship with the Prophet. And it's not just that he tells them what is halal and what is haram. And it's not just that he indicates to them special technicalities about how you live. But they get from him the ethos of everything he represents. And this is why we say no one can approach the Sahaba. No one can approach them. Because their dhikr is so great and you have no access to it. Their dhikr begins with looking at the Prophet. Looking at him is dhikr. Looking at a wali can be dhikr as well. Because they make you think of God, don't they? But what about the Prophet? They look at him. They touch him. They embrace him. They shake his hand. They smell the fragrance of his being. Okay, so uh, they have this relationship too. And then when he passes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the sahaba become the shaykhs of the tabi'een, of the successors. <coughs> and of course they do that in everything, the transmission of the Qur'an, the transmission of fiqh, the transmission of all the knowledge of, his, of, of Islam, but also the transmission of that nine-tenths of knowledge that made Umar special, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of Ihsan. And then the successors will do that with the successors of the successors. So this is not something that was made up. And we will talk about it in greater detail, but it goes back to that. Um, also, you see this Shaykh, maybe I shouldn't say this, uh, Okay, I'm going to say Shaykh Murid relationship uh, in the story in Surah Al-Kahf, which every one of you knows, in verses 65 to 68, of Moses and that incredible man who was given ladunni knowledge. And we in our commentary tradition refer to him as Al-Khidr. And we don't... It's. It, this is the same kind of relationship as the relationship 
It's similar or analogous to the relationship between Gabriel and the prophet. And again, with, with Khidr, we have to be careful how we understand that because we don't know exactly who or what he was. And when we study Aqidah uh, and we talk about the prophets, then we also say that when it comes to Al-Khidr, we don't know whether he was a wali or whether he was a prophet or whether he was a messenger. And so we have to just leave it at that because but the thing is, is that here you see that he is showing a different dimension to the reality of things that is not there in the outward Sharia. Of course, he has the authority to do that. And he has the special dispensation to do that. And the awliya can't do things like that. Okay, they don't have the dispensation to do that. So we have to be careful how we use that. But nevertheless, you see that same relationship. That Moses is sent to him whoever he was whether he was a prophet or a, a messenger. And here we've got ikhtilafat. We've got differences between our fuqaha. Some will say he was a messenger. Some will say he's a nabi. And um, some will say that he's probably a wali. But, uh, you know, we don't know for sure. We don't know sure for sure. But in any case, you have that relationship of taking from the other, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, now also, um, we have one minute left, and so I'm going to say that there are also dangers that radiate from the murids, and we want to talk about the murids and muridas, and we're just going to say one minute, probably I shouldn't even do that, but maybe we can say that, you know, we said <coughs> there are shuyukh and there are muluk, there are sheikhs and there are kings, Sheikh should never be a king, and the shuyukh should be shuyukh, and the murid should be murids, not shuyukh. And uh, so the murids can mess things up big time. And this is why it's so important for the murid also to learn how to be one. Just like we talked about the little boy who goes and brags about his father. My father's better than your father. And the murids are like that too. My sheikh is better than your sheikh. My path is better than your path. And they can really cause a lot of harm in that. And when we talked about the false sheikh, well, the paradigm of the false sheikh is the cult master. You know, the creator of groupies, whom he controls like a cult. All right? Um, but you can actually have good sheikhs who are not false sheikhs, and the murids and muridas turn them into cult idols. And again, the sheikhs are fallible and human, and they don't know everything, you know, from the earth, from, from the heavens to the earth. And the sheikh may not know even that that's going on. So the murids mess up a lot of things. And uh, having said that outrageous and frightening statement. I hope I didn't offend or frighten anybody. <clears throat> but let's stop now, and we'll start the task of attempting to answer some questions. With Jazakumullah, kulli khair, and pray for me, pray for me. So here they are, and you give the. We have this wonderful team. Should I mention you by name? Okay, I'm not going to mention the team, although I'm looking at them, but. I won't mention them, uh, but they've gone through these. So the first question, actually, that they wanted me to talk about tonight was the trauma of the false sheikh, and we did talk about that in the lecture. Hmm. Uh, one of the parts of the question that I didn't answer, though, <coughs> is that if a person was abused by their sheikh, can they remain in their tariqah without following the sheikh? Should they speak about what happened or cover up the faults of the sheikh to avoid fitna, especially if no one would believe them anyway? It's best to leave. It's best to leave. That is not good company. That is not safe company. And as we said here, I think we did answer this pretty well. You don't want to fixate and you don't want to rival and you don't want to destroy, but 
sometimes you have to warn. Sometimes you have to warn. <clears throat> but to just stay there with the Shaykh, um, again, it's probably irresponsible of me to speak in such general terms because here we're talking about different situations and probably each situation should be dealt with on its own. I know a situation that comes to mind of a very false sheikh and of a person who was traumatized by that false sheikh. And he didn't want to tell anybody and then things got really difficult for him. And then finally he decided, because then the false sheikh began to attack him and slander him in front of the other murids. And so he felt, maybe I need to talk. So um, he decided, I'm going to go talk to one of the best murids I know. And he did. And he came to that murid and he said, like, this man has done this and done that, and I've discovered him to be this way. And he said, oh, so you finally found out. So this murid <laughs> always knew that was a false sheikh. And actually he always lived on the edges. And he would be there, and he would receive everyone, and he loved everyone, but actually if you think about him, if you know him, he was never actively in the circle. And yet he loved the people, and he wanted to stay around them, so he stayed on the margins. And amazingly, this person, when he said, I've got to talk to somebody, he went to him. <laughs> and this man was just the one to talk to. And again, maybe we can go back here to the fact that the Sufis often say that to come to a real sheikh, many people, and not all or most, but many people have to go through a false one first. And maybe that could be a false teacher even, you know, an abusive teacher. And um, I know that sometimes those are the best ones because they cannot be destroyed by that person. They will be traumatized and it may last for years. But then they're going to radiate after that. And in this case, that's what was happening with this person. Because that particular murid could have been his sheikh at that moment. And, and in fact, he told him, that's the way it is, <laughs> and that's the way he is, and I advise you to do such and such and such and such, and I advise you to go to such and such a place. And that's where the door opened for that man, that man. So um, it's an amazing thing, and it's an ugly thing to talk about, but it's a dark reality that we have to be honest about. How do you fall in love with God? How do you fall in love with God? Um, I wish I knew. I wish I knew how. I would love to fall in love with God. But um, <clears throat> God's love for you is what comes first. God's love for you is what comes first. And then you are filled with the love of Him. And we can go back to the beautiful hadith we talked about, that my servant does not approach me. He doesn't draw closer and closer by anything better than what I've made obligatory. So you do what you're supposed to do. And brother or sister, pray the five prayers. And if you haven't been praying them, please start. You know, Ramadan's on the door, at the door. And fast the fast. Do the fard, and then try to do the nawafil. And that's not just the nawafil of salat, and the voluntary acts of salat or of fasting, but do other nawafil. Feed the poor. Help the orphan. There's so many things you can do. Help the homeless. Those are nawafil also. And when God loves you, He takes you over. And when I love Him, I become the eyes with which he sees, the ears with which he hears, the hand with which he grasps, the foot with which he walks. <laughs> the love of God is a great thing. And again, we talked about Rabi al Adawiyah. She is one of the greatest of them all. 
And she used to say that, and God loved her, and she loved him. She fell in love infinitely with God. And she said, he's a jealous lover. And I can't love anything else with him. So she didn't love the world or anything. They tell the story of the robber who came into her house by night. <laughs> it was the best mistake he ever made. You know, and there's nothing to steal. And then he, and, and then he gets ready to go. There's nothing there. And then she's sitting in the corner watching. And he notices her and she says, take the prayer rug. You know, just take the prayer rug. You can take that. You've got to have something. You know, you, know, you can't leave em empty-handed. Beautiful people. <clears throat> but the love of God is a high station, and God gives it to you. And you try to earn it, the Ibn Ilahi Ta'ala. Um, not all of us can find a righteous sheikh. What then should we do in the terms of our tasawwuf, our path? Um, do lots of salat on the Prophet. Do lots of salat on the Prophet. And pray that God gives you a shaykh. And um, seek and you will find. Seek and you will find. And do lots of salat on the Prophet. And then also you can say the dua, Ant al hadi, Ant al haq, Lays al hadi illallah. Ant al hadi, Ant al haq, you God are the guide. There is no guide but God. Ant al hadi. And to haq, you God are the guide, you God are the real, there is no guide but God, that will help you. And you can also say the dua, that's a dhikr. <clears throat> Allahumma dullani ala man yadulluni alayk. O oh God, guide me to the one who will guide me to you. Dullani ala man yadulluni alayk. Guide me to the one who will guide me to you. And God will answer your prayer. <clears throat> Are there many great sheikhs in the world today? Well, I have to be careful the way I speak. I'm an ignorant man. What do I know? The fact is there are many charlatans. There are many frauds. And unfortunately, I do know that. And unfortunately, I've seen more of them than I ever cared to see in my life. And there's nothing more painful than to see that. There's nothing more painful to see that. You know, but um, there are real ones there. And here, the sincerity of your search is imperative. If you really want him, you will get him. And if you truly need him, that need will be fulfilled. So, inshallah, God bless us with that. But be safe and be careful. Um, Um, why would Sufis take the harder path? The Azaim, in the light of the Hadith, verily God loves his ruchas, that God loves his licenses. Um, first of all, they also take licenses. Uh, when we mentioned yesterday uh, that particular quotation, you know, from one of the early awliya, that they follow the Sharia and they don't follow the ruchas, they, they follow the Azaim, that's a general statement. And uh, that was from the early time, by the way. So um, they do have that tendency. And usually they do that privately. And they are often very careful not to do it in public because they don't want to invite other people to do that too. So usually when they're hard on themselves, they're hard on themselves in private. And you don't even know about it. You don't know what they do at night. You don't know, I mean, a lot of them, I mean, the amazing things they do. Not just to talk about ruchas, but the service they do. You know, um, and they don't talk about it. That's what I've seen. They don't talk about it. Um, 
you know. I could give you examples of that. I remember a sheikh who put me in a hotel room in a particular city and he said, I'll be back in the morning, I have to go visit some people tonight and they have a particular problem. And he mentioned to me what the nature of that problem was. And he gave me some money. I was dependent on him. I uh, didn't have the money myself. And he, he, he said, buy your dinner with this and buy your breakfast tomorrow. I'll be here in the morning at breakfast. And he came. And alhamdulillah, then we had a journey together after that. But, um, and he said, yeah, I went and saw them. So I thought they were just someplace else in town. And, um, and I didn't ask about it. It's not my business. Then, somebody else started to talk about this, and it turned out that he had actually traveled 200 miles, and he had visited a whole center and a big sheikh, and they were having a big problem, and he stayed up all night, and they solved the problem the best they could, and then he came back to me, never having slept the whole night. And I slept all night, and I ate, I can still remember what I ate. It was so delicious. It was, a, and I had the best breakfast ever because he gave me lots of money. So I had indulged, and when he came, he indulged me in another breakfast. And, um, you know, and I thought he'd just been on the other side of town. See, so that's the way they are. They, they hide the things they do. And, um, you know, they do great things, really. And a lot of times they do them secretly. Nobody knows they do them. But, um, again, the early Sufis, they love to be ascetic. They love to give up the world. Um, they love to give away. Uh, Ibrahim ibn Adham, who's one of the most famous of the second century, early Sufis. He was a prince of Persia. He had everything in the world. And then God over... There's the ghazwa of God. You know, you talk about, you want to love God? Beware. Because he may overtake you with a ghazwa. And then he, he's got you. And you're not a prisoner of war, but you're a happy prisoner of war. That's what happened to Ibrahim ibn Adham that God overtook his soul and he gave away everything he had. And he left his kingdom to his brothers and sisters and cousins. And then, um, and this is in the time of Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa. And Ibrahim ibn Adham then, uh, you know, sets out on this path of love and of incredible knowledge of God. And he is recognized as one of the greatest of the Salaf. So God can also overwhelm you and take you over. Um, but these people, they didn't follow Ruchas very much. Ibrahim ibn Adham is like that. Many of the others are like that. Um, Imam al-Haddad, may God be pleased with him, he even says, and I won't be able to quote him accurately, but he says words to the effect that at the end of time, towards the end of time, it will be good for the Sufi to have wealth and to have a good house, and to have other things. Because that will be a time when people no longer know the value of poverty, and they no longer honor it at all. Whereas in the traditional Muslim world, you know, we didn't want to be poor, and we were rich. But the <coughs> poverty of the person who gives up the world for the sake of God, we held that in the highest esteem. That was a different culture. And of course, that culture can become decadent. And one of the things that will turn people about against the Sufis is when they become beggars, which they were never supposed to be. And if you've traveled around the Muslim world, you've probably encountered that yourself. And Sufi beggars can be horrible. Okay? So things change with the changing of time. And so he said, in the end, toward the end of time, no one will respect poverty. And their belief will be in their eyes. So you better be able to support yourself. You bet. So we don't take these things as absolutes. Okay? And they don't apply them as absolutes either. Hmm. How does one cultivate sakha and nafs? How do you cultivate overflowing generosity of the soul? And... Um, 
I've only got one answer to that company. And um, I remember when I went to my first primary sheikh. I was with him for 19 years. And he was a great man. He was an Eritrean refugee. Beautiful man, beautiful man. I loved him. Oh, my God. And he's the one who brought me to the sheikh I have now, when he died. You know, but um, when I first visited him in his hut in Jeddah, he's a refugee. He had nothing. And he's got a family. And he's got to feed them. And he gave me everything he had. Even a jar of instant coffee. Because I remember a big Nescafe. And I really thought to myself that, how can you do this? How can you do this? Because I knew in myself I wouldn't be able to. I knew in myself I wouldn't be able to do this. Because, you know, maybe I can be generous. And maybe I've had some generosity in my bones. My grandfather was extremely generous. Extremely generous. So maybe I've got some in my bones. You know, but I couldn't do this. He's poor. He's got nothing. You don't even have money to buy fool with. And that's what he ate. Fool for breakfast, fool for night. Yemeni fool, by the way. Oh, I love fool. But his fool, I wish I could eat it right now. It was so delicious. <laughs> you know, it was so delicious. And, um, you know, it's like, how could you do that? And I really was baffled. And then you begin to learn the lessons. You keep their company, you become like them. If you are not courageous, and I'm not courageous, how could you possibly become courageous? Keep the company of a courageous man or woman. Uh, keep the company of a generous man or woman. Because that's where we get that. That would be my answer to that question. And also, we get khuluk through takhaluk. We get good character through trying to imitate that good character. So also try to pay, try to give, try to give of your time. Give to your spouse, give to your children. All of that is nafs. And even though you may be smiling and you wish I could get done with this and go back to work, uh, that's not hypocrisy. That's tekhaluk. Could you please explain the difference between a wound and a trauma? Um, you know, the Greek word trauma, as we said, means wound. And it comes into the English language through Greek. We get many words from Greek and from Latin, and we get them from other languages, even Arabic. Even Arabic. For example, the word arsenal. You know a football team by that name? Yeah. But arsenal comes from Arabic. What is the Arabic for arsenal? Descent. Hmm? Descent. No. no. Magazine comes from machzan. But arsenal, and I didn't hear your word, but arsenal is from Darus Sana'a. Darus Sana'a. Factory. Darus Sana'a. And I can't tell you that story because that will take all night. But those are arsenals. The Muslims of Portugal and Spain created to build ships to fight the Vikings. That is history. And it makes my skin get goosebumps because that's one of the most important lessons in history that I know of, and it's never taught, by the way. But trauma comes into English through Greek. And my understanding of the difference between a wound and a trauma, at least in English, and I, I don't, I can't talk about Greek, is that the wound heals. The trauma doesn't. It festers. So my understanding of the trauma is it's a wound that festers. And festers means it, it gets putrid. It never is right again. It gives off pus. It's broken open again and again. So it's not good. It's not good at all. And um, Rumi says that the light enters you through the wound. So you get wounded. 
I've been wounded too. There's none of us that don't have scars, brothers and sisters. Not a one of us. But you want it to be a scar, which is a healed wound. And through that healed wound, light can come in. And let the light come in. So even if you had a trauma, and I've had traumas too. You know, even if you've had a trauma, you want that trauma to cease to be a festering wound. And you want it to become a healed wound. And then light will come in through it, the Ibn Ilahi Ta'ala. How is one generous with their soul? Um, I wish I could give you the best answers on earth. I can't. But um, usually when we talk about the generosity of the soul, we will compare it or we will contrast it with generosity of the pocketbook. And if you are generous with your money, you deserve to be called Karim and Sahi. You deserve that. And it's a great thing to be generous with your money. But, and I think those of you who are like that, and I presume you're all like that, is that you see that to give of my money is actually relatively easy compared to giving of myself. And think of the father who has no time for his children, but he always buys them toys. And it actually may not be easy for him to buy those toys. He may be spending a lot on the toys that he buys, but he can't give them time. And all they want is time. In fact, they don't even want the toys. Not if it's at the price of their father. If I could have my father instead of the toys, I would take my father any day. And this is why also we say when we talk about marriage and mothering and fathering, you know, the greatest thing that you can do for your children is to love your spouse. This is the foundation of marriage. And we never want to lose it. Because the greatest gift you give to your child is that you love the mother or father of that child who is your spouse. My mother and father are two streams that come together in my heart and they make that river that is me. You know, the greatest gift God can give us is a mother and father who love each other. Okay? But, you know, this is what we want. That love. And that love is generosity of soul. You know, because to love each other, we must be generous with each other. And, of course, to love your wife or your spouse your husband, if you're a wife, you know, then, you know, you have to, you should give many things and give flowers and take them out and give them a date and there's all kinds of things to do, really. But give them of you. Give them of your time. So giving of ourselves, listening to people, helping people, visiting people, you know, so and so sick, but I don't have time. I've got to finish such and such. He's on the other side of Chicago. Maybe you should get in the car and go anyway. And wait in the mercy of God. You see, so, Sakha um, nefs, generosity of the soul, is giving of what is most precious to you. And it's probably not your money, it's probably you yourself, your time your affection, your patience, uh, your teaching, your giving the child time to sit down and explain with them, think, explain to them things. Uh, and this is what we see in the Mashayikh too, is that they are extremely generous with themselves. They're extremely generous with themselves. It's as if they have no time for themselves. And who was like that? The beloved of creation, right? The Prophet Muhammad and then his great companions. And Umar, when he becomes the Caliph, he doesn't have time for Umar, does he? He's got to take care of the Ummah, he's got to take care of his family, he's got to give his Lord his right and pray and sleep. No time for that. And these are incredible people. And again, that ability of a lot of the awliya 
And I'm not just saying Sufis, I mean awliya, a lot of the good believers in general, who are also awliya but maybe not Sufis, the ability of a lot of them to do incredible acts of worship at night and in fasting um, at the expense of sleep, often it's because they are so generous with themselves. They give of themselves and then God gives them that in return. <clears throat> Uh, so this one question says that um, this person expresses that they are very happy when we come to this blessed country and um, you know when we have this homecoming this is for me homecoming I'm so happy to be here and that's one of the great things about these travels that we're allowed to do is that you every time the more you visit the country the more it becomes home. You know, um, you truly fall in love with that place. I've loved Egypt um, most of my life, Muslim life, because this is one of the first countries I came to. My first daughter was born here, in Duqbi, by the way. Mustashfa al-Katib. And, um, you know, so Egypt is printed on my soul. I learned e Arabic in Egypt. So I love this country. It, it has, it holds me. But every time I come back, I love it more. Every time I come back, I'm more happy to come back. So we love to come back. And, um, and that's true also. And I, I, know there's, I know there should be no jealousy here, and how could there be? But that would be true of every country I visit. You know that the more you visit it, the more you know it, the more you love it. And we wish we could go everywhere and be everywhere. I really do. It's not easy to do that. I don't know that trick yet. <laughs> but what the person is saying is that when you go, are things the same? And um, what I would say is that this beautiful companionship that we have here, of you beautiful men and women, young men and young women, a hold to that. And I know that you do anyway. I know that you do anyway, but in holding to that and cultivating that, then you keep us with, with you all the time. And, um, you know, our hearts should never be separate. It's said that if you cannot be present with the Shaykh in his absence, you're probably not present with him in his presence. There is a special quality there of attachment, which is spiritual, which enables us to be with the Shaykh in his presence, to be with him. And you're in heaven. And that heaven is the only one I know. I hope to know the other one too, and be there with you. But uh, that's paradise on earth. And you know the great Arabs of the pre-Islamic period, I, we love the, I love them. The Sufis love their poetry, by the way. We talked about how do you fall in love with God. I mean, they write about love all the time, don't they? And, uh, of course, they've got the stories of Salma, and they've got the stories of Layla. The Sufis didn't make that up. That comes from a real Salma and a real Layla. And you could give me the other names, right? And he falls in love with her, and she belongs to another tribe. And he shouldn't go see her, but his life means nothing to him because of love. That is love. And we shouldn't talk about that too much, but when you fall in love, you know, you forget consequences. You become a fool of the love that you have. And that's why the Sufis love that poetry, because they would say that, if so-and-so, and I'm not going to mention any poets, but if so-and-so could risk his life to visit the human Selma or Layla, then what about you and God? Can't you give everything for that? Can't you devote everything to that? So the, the spiritual bond is a big thing, and that makes us present at all times, 
And inshallah, may we be successful at that. Um, these are blessed nights for me. These are Arabian nights. <laughs> these are my Arabian nights in this beautiful country of Egypt, which this is a great place. I mean, uh, I'm not a hypocrite to say that. I love it. I love it. This is the land of Abraham. Abraham came here, didn't he? Sarah came here, didn't she? With him. Um, Hajar, the mother of our prophet, was from here. This is the land of Joseph. This is the land of Jacob. This is the land of Rachel. This is the land of Rachel's children. This is the land of the twelve tribes. They were all here. You know that. This is the land of the great first Mary, who is the sister of Harun. She's the big sister of Harun and Moses. And that beautiful sister who will follow, you know, the uh, basket or the tabut down the Nile to see that it goes to Pharaoh. Her name was Maryam. And Mary is named after her. That's why she's Ukht Harun. That's why she's the sister of Aaron, because that's the sister of Aaron. And she is probably either a Haruni or a Musawi. And, and these are Christian studies that, um, uh, that I love to talk about, but I'm not qualified and I don't have time to talk about right now. But this is the land of that Mary. It is the land, you know, of Moses, of Aaron, his big brother. Moses is the little brother. And this is the land also, probably of the Virgin Mary, that she came here with the baby Jesus. Again, we don't know that for sure, but I believe it's true. And I have a right to, and some scholars would agree, because she had to protect the baby Jesus from the Pharaoh of her time, and his name was Herod. And just as Pharaoh killed all the baby males to try to kill Moses, so also Herod tried to kill all the babies of the children of Israel to try to kill the Messiah. And then Mary has to protect him from Herod. He will kill him. So probably that's why, that's what the Bible says. That's why she comes to Egypt. And I believe that's true. So even the baby Jesus was here. Probably. I believe that. And then what about the Odia who are here? Aqtab, you know, Abdal, Autad. And the Nile River, you know, the word Nile is like Nile. It's like Nawal. It's a gift. It is a gift of God. And it is a river of paradise. And so is the Euphrates. And Ibn Hajar tells us, we know that from Sahih Hadith, but that's because Ibn Hajar says that one of the sources of the Nile, which is probably in the mountains of Abyssinia, where the Nile comes from, that's one of the places it's come from, is actually from the garden itself. And so, always in that Nile, there is water from paradise. So this is a great country you have. It really is. And you are beautiful people. And every time I come here, you say, Nawarta Misr, or whatever you say, and your beautiful expressions. I don't believe that. Egypt, Nawarani Anna. This is where I get my light. This is where I came. You know, and uh, inshallah, Allah bless you. Allah muwafiqna lima tuhibbu wa tarda. Wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada. Wa amitna ala kalimati al-huda. Alimna ma yanfa'una. Alimna ma yanfa'una. Wafiqna lil'amali bima alamtana bih. Wa ja'alna... I forgot the dua. <laughs> I'm thinking about other things. اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وبارك فينا واقضي حوائجنا آمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته